Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, once again, this is Bruce Snell from Nozomi Networks. Uh, quick reminder about me, I've got about 25 plus years in the cybersecurity industry and about 10 or so in the OT security industry. And part of what we're doing with these interview sessions is we're actually taking a look at different topics in security and speaking with individual experts around these particular topics so we can get a little bit more information. And today we're talking with Sandeep Loda from Nozomi as well. Uh, Sandeep, uh, thank you for joining us. Hi, Bruce. Thank you for having me on the show today. Yeah, of course. Hey, you know, Sandeep, part of why I want to talk to you today is, you know, I know you've got a, quite a bit of knowledge around security operations centers or SOCs, right? Um, and I thought we'd maybe take a little bit of time to kind of delve into why you need a SOC, what it is, who owns it, you know, it's just, just the general area around, you know, why people build SOCs and what they do with them. So let's just start off with, you know, what kind of SOC 101, like why, why do people build SOCs and, and what do they use them for? Great question, Bruce. So traditionally, SOC, as we're all aware, stands for Security Operations Center. And this tends to be the nerve center of an enterprise environment where they have single visibility to a multitude of alerts and alarms and health information coming from various devices, particularly their security type devices into the domain. Now, a SOC is generally staffed by several people who are tasked with responding to alerts and alarms, triaging them, and then working to identify the right person who can remediate. So SOC is an extremely important component of a security framework for an organization. The interesting thing about security operation centers is that we have evolved to a fairly mature level of operational insight within the IT domains. And as we're about to explore, there's been a proliferation in OT awareness as well as IoT awareness which is now driving the need to either create a separate SOC or to try and integrate these new components and parts of the network into your existing SOC. Yeah, no, it's, it's great insight. And we'll, we'll get back to that integration in a, in a little bit, but I do want to take a step back maybe and let's talk about kind of the accountability, right? So who's ultimately responsible for this, the, the SOC, right? Because we talk about, you know, it's staffed by, you know, numerous people, ideally 24 seven, right? Um, who ultimately does that, you know, in, in organizations does that roll up into? In general, what I've seen, and this can vary, it depends on how an organization has been set up, what their operational structure looks like. Generally not uncommon to find the security teams or security operations in particular, in charge of managing and responding to SOC alerts. Um, however, there are a number of organizations that we work with who are starting to look to outsource that kind of functionality. So there are a number of occasions where a SOC is managed and run and staffed in-house. Um, again, depending on what type of organization, what the budget looks like, what their headcount looks like, manpower, things of that nature. However, more and more increasingly, we are seeing customers turning to specialists um, from an outsourcing perspective, people that are highly trained at responding to these alerts and they sit in managed service locations where they operate or ma manage multiple SOCs for multiple customers. Yeah, so it, it's interesting that you talk about that because there, I think there's a couple actually different, couple different flavors of that, you know, having someone else manage a SOC, right? Because there's the concept of the managed secu uh, security services provider, right? So the MSSP who maybe has their own SOC that they're using or, you know, their own SIM that they're pulling in data from all of their customers and just kind of handling it as one big, you know, w one big um, environment. But then there's also the, the, the other angle, which is the SOC as a service model, right? Where someone will actually come in and remotely manage your own SOC, right? So maybe you've got you know, your own SIM implementation uh, and then you outsource it to people to come in and actually go and, and do the day-to-day -day management of that. Um, and there's also this kind of hybrid that I've seen a lot. And, and I'm speaking from you know, having spent time working at an MSSP, right? Doing, doing exactly this where you know an organization may have a small security team that can staff it maybe nine hours a day five days a week and then they outsource those other 
the other remaining hours of the rest of the day and the rest of the week. So they actually are able to get 24 by 7 coverage with a team that can conceivably only really do nine by five, right? So I think there's different, there's even different flavors when you start talking about having other people manage your, your sim for you. Absolutely, and you touched on a really good point, Bruce. Depending on the size of the organization, a SOC is more of a virtual construct than a physical construct. Try think of a SOC as a virtual meeting space where if an organization is large enough, take some of our global customers that we work with where they have staff of thousands of people within IT services, and they have the ability to rotate people in and out of their virtual workspace around the clock to maintain that 24-7 presence. Other organizations that may not have the budget, the expertise, the talent, um, will often turn to outsourcers in an attempt to find someone that can help them uh, manage these environments and understand the true nature of the alerts that are coming through. We've all heard of incidences where SOC analysts end up having basically overload. You know, there's an overabundance of messages, there's an overabundance of alerts. Some of the alerts are confusing in nature, they're coming in at a rapid pace. Historically, we have had incidents of SOC teams becoming overwhelmed and ending up muting all the alarms, which of course, uh, as we all know, is not recommended uh, in any way, shape or form, simply because that allows the opportunity for bad actors and exploits to actually uh, infiltrate the environment as a lot of these alarms are turned off. This is a common attack vector and technique as well used to confuse SOC analysts and SOC teams. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting, the, the, the whole idea of you know the, being overloaded, right? Because um, at one of my previous jobs, the, the CISO, uh, he said to me, he goes, look, you know, there's really only like 200 good SOC people in North America and we're all fighting over them, right? Um, and you, you get these people that, you know, it, it's hard to train up a SOC analyst and, and keep them around, right? Because they, you know, you train, you train somebody up and then they start going for a senior uh, position somewhere else or they, they want to migrate or, you know, they get to the point where they don't want to work at 3 a.m. on a Friday. Uh, and so, you know, they go to find a job where they can work normal hours and that leaves people in alert, right? And so that that is why I think a lot of times people kind of go back to that outsourcing model, right? Because they don't necessarily have enough people, enough quality people to be able to, to manage it 24 by 7. Um, and I mean, and it's, it's, it's a growth process, right? Because you don't necessarily have to have everyone in the SOC be a level three analyst, right? You've got... You know, you can have a bunch of level one analysts and then maybe one or two that are, you know, two level three analysts that are hanging out, you know, waiting for some sort of event to happen, right? So you've got the first level that's kind of filtering through all of the events and then saying, oh, well, th this looks weird. I don't really know how to deal with this. Let me pass this on to, you know, to somebody a little bit more senior, right? Um, so it, it's definitely an area where I think people can get really quickly overwhelmed, right? And I, and I think it's it's part of that management of a SOC um, that I think is a kind of a, an, I won't say lost science, but it's it's an overlooked science, right? Having to, having the knowledge and wherewithal to, to be able to properly manage the SOC. Um, and, and not only just manage it, but how do you, how do you integrate that SOC into your overall security program, right? And I mean, maybe that's something we could talk about as well. Like what, now that you've got a SOC built up, how does that integrate into the overall pro, uh, program? Absolutely, great points, uh, Bruce. One of the things as we're all very well aware is a SOC is much more than having a central repository where alerts are sent. The key component of a SOC is the reactionary component, right? What do we do when these alerts come in and understanding the nature of the different alerts coming in and how to triage them. Of course, we're all aware different alerts have different severities, have different remediations, have different impacts to the business. So one of the key challenges for SOC analysts is being able to understand a customer's environment and to be able to apply those alerts and understand whether or not they need, there needs to be a real-time remediation. That's good. Yeah, great point. And, and I think one of the things that we should really, you know, make sure we don't overlook is that that visibility, right? Because in order for any of this to take place, you have to make sure that you're actually seeing everything that you potentially need to see. Um, and I think that's where a lot of organizations are kind of hitting these roadblocks is they're getting data in, but how do they guarantee that they're actually seeing all of the data that they need to see? 
Um, and you know, that's one of those things I think that we do really well at Nozomi is providing that additional level of visibility um, into you know environments where traditionally there wasn't a lot of visibility, right? If we think about industrial side, um, you know, there you know from an IT perspective, it's it's an area that's been kind of dark for a while. Absolutely agreed. Um, you know, and and like you touched on, one of the key strengths of our platform is the ability for us to correlate and put some contextualization around these alerts. Instead of sending a plain alert, we've got a concept um, called an incident within our tool. So we can actually take a multitude of individual alerts and string them together to paint the picture of an incident of what occurred. That is another challenge traditionally with SOC teams is trying to take individual alerts and data points and trying to connect the dots and stitch them into an incident, if you will, which then will theoretically have a playbook for mitigation. So by taking a lot of that correlation work out of the OT side of things, at least, Nozomi Networks is able to provide clean alerting with extreme amounts of context, which help quicker resolution, quicker diagnosis, quicker troubleshooting. So let's talk about context, right? That's that's the word that I, I really picked out of, of your response there. So from a, from contextual information, I think requires insight, right? And, and requires the the access and visibility, right? And you know, if you look at traditional methods, um, you know, from a from a SOC perspective, everybody's pulling in data from you know into their sim from maybe network IPS or maybe from a firewall or maybe from Active Directory. Um, you know, how what do you think is a really good approach to making sure that you're you're spreading that visibility out across your entire domain, right? Because there are going to be areas where you know, like for example, if we th- if we talk about pulling data in from a firewall, that's mostly north-south traffic, right? That's traffic coming from, you know, inside the network to outside. What are some some methods for going and making sure that you're seeing data that's going east-west, right, across inside your network? Super question, you know, and as virtualization continues to increase, particularly in the OT and IoT worlds now, this is something very new for us. IT has been comfortable with virtualization for over a decade. It's mature, it's understood, it's executed cleanly, and it's relatively pain-free at this point in time. As we know, traditionally, our environments have tended to be largely hardware-based, and that's generally because of the locations and environments we tend to find ourselves operating in. Um, Obviously, we work in the world's most critical infrastructures, which includes some very dirty and ruggedized environments. We need to be sure that we can operate in harsh working environments, that's extreme temperature conditions. Um, You know, not to mention things like the ability to operate in environments that have flammable gases. You know, we have the ability to provide an intrinsically safe appliance. However, as our customers are maturing and looking to adopt virtualization even more, we have kept in lockstep with that. So we have also developed a line of virtual and containerized software, which can help customers who decide to go down the virtualization road in their OT environments. We can now embed within these infrastructures. For example, our container software has the ability to sit inside certain vendors, actual layer two, layer three switches, you know, so we can integrate as a container onto another piece of infrastructure to simplify management, one less device to support, one less bump on the wire. And as soon as we can integrate inside that virtualized infrastructure, that gives us the ability to visualize that east-west traffic. Instead of relying on north-south traversing through firewalls, routers, gateways, physical devices, the virtual world is very much about that east-west realm. And by us being able to inject and embed ourselves into that framework, we provide that visibility from an east-west perspective, which as we know is extremely important within ICS monitoring. Um, You know, and I think as we start talking about, um, you know, looking into the OT world in particular, um, you know, from an IT perspective, like traditional IT security, blocking is okay, 
right? Being able to go in and, you know, if I see this event X, go ahead and block it and, and drop the packet or do a TCP reset or something, right? Um, that's not necessarily something that you can do in an OT environment, right? Because you may be blocking, you know, a, a signal from a safety information system, right? That's telling you something's on fire, right? And you don't, you don't, that's something you definitely don't want to block, right? Um, so this is where that, that ability, that concept of having to do that 24 by 7 monitoring really comes in, right? Because if you can't actively block something, the next best thing is to go in and be watching for new and unusual traffic, right? And so that's, I think, where the benefit of having a fully staffed, fully staffed SOC comes in, because now you've got the ability to have eyes on glass 24 by 7. Absolutely. And you bring up a great point. Bruce, the fact that in our world, um, a blocking or any type of mitigation action is generally the last thing on our list when we do spot and anomaly. This is common practice in IT, no problem at all. IT devices, IT domains, IT enterprises, they're fairly tolerant of devices coming and going, including uh, critical systems such as domain controllers. Everything's got backups in those worlds. Everything is designed to be able to take a single point of failure. In the OT world, imagine an OT process is like a piece of chain under tension. You can't remove a chain without impacting the rest of the operation with what's going on. So we've got to be very surgical and strategic about how we respond to alerts and incidents. And just like you alluded to, um, you simply can't start removing devices or components of a process. Generally, a process contains safety systems uh, which is point number one. And number two, these are much larger systems that have a much larger impact. When you've got 100 or 200 components in a process, simply by removing one or shutting one down or trying to bypass one, that can actually completely change the operational process. So um, customers are looking to us to maintain continuity, to maintain um, consistency across their environments. So when we start to spot anomalies, we can create alerts, we raise um, the awareness within the customer so that according to their playbooks, they can decide that, oh yes, this is a mission critical system. Uh, we definitely cannot block that off the network. We understand that this device is misbehaving um, or operating outside of its learned baseline or profile. Um, and at that point, it really becomes more about educating the customer and educating the business about what the steps to take um, for a safe remediation are. You know, that's, that's a great point. And I like that analogy. It's almost like, you know, I, I'm sure everybody at some point in their, their life has been riding a bike and, and you lose one of the links in your chain. Your chain derails and you lose one of the links and you're, you're kind of hosed, right? And it's, it's the you know, similar sort of environment. Um, you know, and, and that actually kind of leads into another d discussion point, which is, you know, minimizing the impact of breaches, right? So part of what, you know, the SOC, you know, is, is there for is to not only watch for what's going on, but also help to minimize an issue if there is a breach in place, which I think becomes especially important in the OT environment, right? Because in, as we've discussed from the IT side, a lot of those responses are automated, right? And that's the whole promise of EDR and XDR and, and MDR, whatever you want to, whatever letter you want to put in front of DR. Um, that's part of that whole pro that promise is to have that you know automated response. But in OT, you can't necessarily have an automated response. So, how do you utilize the SOC to help minimize the impact of a breach? That's that's a super point to talk about, Bruce. And I often refer to that as the blast radius. What's the blast radius of this impact, of this alert, of this incident? I think the first and most important thing from my perspective is having the right level of SOC operator, right? For instance, if we are interested in understanding operational threats with PLCs and industrial processes, we probably don't want to rely on someone with a heavy Windows desktop background simply because that's not going to be the type of challenges we're going to be running into. So step one is understanding the right people that can understand the threats and environment that they're supporting, right? That makes sense. If you want to troubleshoot networks, you need a network guy. If you want to go do some work on a firewall, you need a firewall guy. 
The same holds true for ICS and IoT networks, right? You need someone with that skill set to not only be able to understand the devices, the languages, the protocols, how they speak, how they operate, but more importantly, when things go south, how to get things back on track. Oh, that's a great, great point. And I think, you know, as you, you talk about the different levels, right? And, and that's part of the, you know, the, the training, I think, that a lot of organizations go through when building out a SOC is, you know, how do we make sure that you're, we're staffed properly? Um, and how do we have the right people that know what to do, right? And you can't expect one person to have, you know, pure, like, in-depth knowledge across all domains of security. Right. I think we've gone we've gone too far. Right. With the, the, the types of threats and, and the types of um, devices that we have out, you know, providing security. It's you know no, no longer the days of like creating the right IP chain rules. Right. And you're done uh -huh. um, there. There's a lot of stuff to, that needs to be understood. And I think that's where, you know, that's that's where a SOC can help really drive into, you know, more advanced concepts like threat hunting, right? So, you know, as we go out and start seeing these new threats and maybe an analyst sees an issue that's flagged based on, you know, maybe a Nozomi alert comes across and says, hey, you've got this incident running through your environment. Well, that needs to be, you know, if they, if they don't know anything about OT, they need to be able to hand that off to the right person to actually do that threat hunting, right? And so let's talk about a little bit about how we utilize info from the SOC to help with threat hunting. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Great question, great question. One of the interesting things that we have to understand is that along with threats and understanding threats, we also have to understand thresholds, right? This is something that is heavily um, emphasized by us and we kind of bundle this under what's called alert tuning, right? Again, this goes back to quality of alerts, not quantity of alerts. So there's things that we can do from a tuning perspective, um, like setting alert thresholds, you know, and I'll give you a great example. If we've got a device in an industrial process system and we start seeing an alert that the device has dropped one packet, you know, is that necessarily something you need to start paging people in in the middle of the night for? Probably not. If that same device starts dropping hundreds of packets for a consecutive amount of time, that's a different story. You know, there's definitely potentially something wrong either at the network layer within the network infrastructure or actually with the device. So by being able to set thresholds for certain alerts and alarms, we can mitigate a lot of exhaustion from the SOC team of having to chase down false leads um, and, and make the quality of the alerts uh, much higher. So alert tuning is something extremely important for every environment. Again, there's no one size fits all for alert turn tuning, obviously because every organization is set up slightly different. They have different metrics and thresholds to respond to alerts and alarms about. So it again goes back to that education, alert tuning, understanding thresholds, understanding the proper baselines and profiles of devices within an environment. Um, a SOC is not a magic bullet. You still have to put in a lot of legwork, a lot of effort, and there's a lot of process required to successfully execute a SOC. Yeah, and that's it's, and I, and I think people are trying to do a little bit of that. I mean, I think SOAR is really helping with that, right? I think you know the the ability to uh, automate a lot of responses, I think, is key, right? To um, you know the because there's one thing to get an event then it's a completely another thing to you know, know what to do with that and how to respond to that and who needs to know about it. And I think a lot of things can be done with automation to kind of help clear out a lot of the, the noise and really just provide you things that you want to focus on, right? Um, my, my, one of my old bosses used to say, you know, like it's not, you know, people talk about looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, what we want to do is hand you a stack of needles, right? And here's the things that are important, right? And I think that's one of the things that you know, SOAR and, you know, XDR, et cetera, start coming into play where they start providing that automated response. And sometimes a response is not a block. It's a, you know, send a text to Sandeep so that, you know, he, he knows that he needs to look at something and investigate this a bit further. Um, so I think part of the hesitancy that people run into sometimes from a SOC perspective is thinking that response is always a block or is always a deny, right? Sometimes a response is, investigate this further. 
Um, and that's something I think we see on the OT side where, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, a device dropping packets. Well, that could be either, you know, hardware failure, that could be an actual attack, that could be a switch having an issue, right? That could be like a literal, you know, rat or something chewing a network cable that's, you know, that, that's causing, uh, you know, a, a signal degradation. And so the, all of these things need to be taken into account. And it, it can't be just a, you know, it can't always just be an automated response of block. It has to be, you know, sometimes it has to be look into this. And that's important when you're dealing with thousands of devices is knowing what to look at, right? How do you, you know, how do you communicate that, right? And I think that's one of those things that we might want to talk about as well is that communication, right? How do you, you know, once you've got the SOC together, how do you work on the communication of all of these events, right? How do you communicate them out to the right people that need to know about these? You know, and that's exactly it. And you, you hit a couple of things on the head really important there. It, uh, it becomes, again, it goes back to quality, not quantity. Education is key here. And you touched on something really important early on. You said a lot of people, the default response when we see an alert or an alarm in the SOC, a very acceptable response in the past has been to just block the device. And that's our IT conditioning, right? We've been doing that for 10 to 15 years in IT. That's totally normal. It's totally acceptable. And it's widely adopted that practice. Just start blocking people out. Whereas we've got to now train our teams to understand the difference between IT and OT networks, IT and OT devices, IoT devices, um, and the impact of simply knocking a device off the network. It becomes a much larger conversation point and, and education point, frankly, about mitigating and dealing with OT alerts versus IT alerts. So Sandeep, you bring up a really good point, and that's one thing that I think I want to pivot to a little bit. Um, let's take a bit of time to talk about the the difference really between IT and OT and even IoT, right? And how how each of those types of, of traffic and, and devices are important for a SOC and how you deal with them. IT, I think, is the easy one to speak about. It's the one most people are familiar with. We have the highest comfort level surrounding it, and we've got the most operational maturity around an IT SOC. Um, a SOC is only as good as the tools and analysts that reside in it, right? Let's be frank. So there's a number of tools that are heavily relied on. One in particular is a SIM, right? A SIM tends to be the brain or the clearing hub of a SOC where it's receiving inbound telemetry from hundreds or thousands of different devices, including devices that are outside of the security realm. So at the SIM level, Traditionally, IT analysts spent a lot of time, they've built up their rules, they've built up their triggers. We've got a very good handle on what's happening from an IT perspective. IoT is a complete wild card. The biggest challenge with IoT is devices are being rushed to market for the sake of revenue of the creators at the expense of security. To this day, we still see devices being released, brand new IoT gadgets, that when we start to do some analysis, some security analysis, some pen testing, just poking around, we very often uncover things like brand new IoT device, devices that use insecure protocols for communication, right? This is a problem. The second thing we are finding a lot of is IoT devices that have hard-coded credentials, right? Another big problem. Another challenge that we're seeing is because these IoT devices are so poorly secured from the manufacturing and design up, they've now become a hot infiltration point to breach a network. We see this all the time. I can't even open a news site without reading about some sort of breach which was determined the root cause happened to be an IP camera or a Fitbit or a thermometer or a pressure monitor. You know, these IoT devices are being deployed en masse, often without the oversight or involvement of IT or security. Therefore, we have insecure devices speaking insecure protocols with hard-coded credentials that are directly connected to mission-critical systems 
we're now seeing these devices deployed in parallel on the same networks as critical systems. You know, and again, this comes back to education. IoT devices are great. Every single one of them, you know, that I use in my life serves a purpose. It makes something easier to do. But the sacrifice on that end is the security because these, again, these devices are being rushed to market. There's very little to no planning or oversight put into security. Yeah, and in fact, you actually, because of that rush to market, you, you see a lot of devices that are being shipped using third-party software libraries, right, that may have vulnerabilities. Um, we yeah. saw that with, you know, with, with LogForge, right, it was a big, a big issue around that. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at traditional IT. I remember the biggest issue, you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago, was somebody having a rogue access point. Right? Somebody wanted to be able to use wireless near their desk, yeah. and all they, and so they they would plug that in, and that became an issue for security. But now, you know, you've got smart lighting, you've got you know, um, you know, printers that are you know that are basically compute devices that are sitting out there. You've got cameras, you got all of these devices that are now filling a, 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 a an actual need. But to your point earlier, they're not being being properly secured, right? And so that's where this kind of IT, OT, IoT convergence is happening, right? As we're seeing more organizations that are using, you know, IoT devices as part of their normal business function. Um, but then you're also seeing from the OT side, you're seeing more traditional environments that would be air gapped in the past are now actually being connected to be able to feed into the supply chain and partner management and ordering and, and all of this, right? And I think that's that that ends up causing bigger issues as well. I think the you know if we look at the the, the pipeline, the colonial pipeline issue from last year, um, the big issue with that was you know the billing uh, got impacted, right? And so because of the billing, it you know it, we they had to shut down the OT environment because they weren't able to actually properly bill for all the product they were shipping out, right? And so that's where you know that's one of, and kind of an example that I, I'd like to get into a little bit more is looking at threats kind of migrating from OT and into IT or more accurately more from IT into OT. Um, what are you what are you seeing from from that regard, Sandy? Yeah, super question. Um, and it all has to do with convergence, right? This is a big buzzword right now, convergence. What does convergence mean? What does that mean to a customer? Each customer I ask that to gives me a slightly different answer of what convergence means to them. As we are now moving away in some instances from segmented networks, convergence is the hybrid coexistence of IT and OT devices living within the same networks or segments. Great, you know, in certain areas, it makes things a lot easier to manage, less VLANs to support, cleaner topology. However, we now introduce the risk of lateral infections you know, being able to cross contaminate your neighbors, which is a problem. And it stems back to something that we've been well trained for for decades in IT. The mentality in IT is if something's broken, fix it. We have the ability every Tuesday to patch windows. You know, if something breaks on a weekly basis, we can patch it. We can update it. We can change firmware. We can turn things off. We can reboot them. These are all widely accepted practices within an IT network. Whereas OT literally has the exact opposite approach. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Don't touch it. Don't upgrade it. We can't upgrade it in many instances. There are a number of scenarios where even if we are able to identify a vulnerability in a particular system, because of the way that system is owned or managed by a third party or a vendor or an engineering procurement firm or an automation and control vendor, quite often there are restrictions in place as to what you can do to those systems. Otherwise, you know, the, the impact can be as severe as voiding a warranty, voiding a support warranty with a critical vendor. So while again in IT, we're used to patching stuff every Tuesday, no problem. Windows puts a patch out every Tuesday, I'm gonna update that hotfix on my machine and stay current. We, we pretty much have to do the exact opposite in OT. Which brings us back to your comment, Bruce, when we now have the convergence of IT and OT and you have a bunch of devices that are highly patched and currently fixed versus 
um, you know, coexisting on a network with a ton of devices that are legacy, that are not patched, that are running old systems that have known vulnerabilities. This is where things start to go a little bit sideways, as you can imagine. Yeah, and it, it becomes <clears throat> it becomes less of a, a patch and more of a, a mitigation, right? I, I uh, was on site with a customer uh, and we did an analysis of their network and I said, look, well, we've got this XP system running here. Like, what what can we do about that? He goes, look, that that device is no longer being manufactured. Um, it run that software runs on XP. I can't do anything to it. So instead of you know trying to apply patches, what we had to do is actually go in and build around you know mitigation around it, right? So let's build very specific firewall rules. Um, let's you know let's make sure that nothing is coming in and out that's not specifically allowed. Um, and we really had to crank down on that because it was something that we ultimately could not fix, right? We couldn't patch it, we couldn't upgrade it, we couldn't do anything. We had to build that that mitigation strategy around, right? And again, I think that that comes back to where you know it, it the mitigation strategy was let's fix everything around it, build a nice hard outside, um, but then also let's double that up with monitoring. Right and coming back to the SOC, right? So that's where the the importance of the SOC came into play because you know we could only fix eighty percent of the issues. Twenty percent was going to go unpatched forever, um, and the only real mitigation for that was to have somebody watching for any suspicious activity on that segment uh, twenty four by seven, right? And sometimes, especially in OT, that's really ultimately all you can do is is watch okay. and 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 respond when there is an issue. Exactly. Our world is all about compensating controls. Very rarely, if we identify a problem, can it be fixed, let alone immediately. You know, so our world is all about building these controls in. And funnily enough, the same driving factors that were pushing for convergence are now starting to push for that split. Again, we've understood the harm and the challenges of trying to coexist with different types of devices within a single network construct. So we are starting to now see the reverse of convergence happening, where customers that previously tried some convergence in some key locations are now finding exactly what the challenges are and having to resegment some of their networks out. So it's a constant battle with technology, with process, with education, and, you know, we see that it's the same thing with outsourcing. How many times do we see the outsourcing, insourcing, outsourcing, insourcing, outsourcing? Um, it all depends on where a particular organization is with their cyber maturity, with their budget, with their staffing, and a number of other non-technical factors. So, uh, great points. And I, and, I, and I agree, there is definitely a, a cyclical nature to security. Um, I definitely see, I've seen in the past where, you know, the, the hard, fast rules now become irrelevant, right? And then 10 years later, they actually become the hard, fast rules again, right? And so um, it kind of expands and contracts, but it's, it's a constantly evolving process. And I think that's one of the things where, you know, as we look at a SOC, you know, the SOC is always also constantly evolving, right? And so, you know, most people build SOCs just for security issues. But I think, you know, there's a lot that we can do to expand a SOC to into operational monitoring, right? So predictive maintenance, that sort of thing. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely critical. Predictive maintenance is something we actually use in the real world. Um, as you're well aware, we provide a, a very detailed level of baselining and profiling on a network. And that includes process by process. So when we start to see things slipping, and this can be in any number of ways, but as soon as something starts to deviate from the baseline, if a process all of a, start, all of a sudden starts to take one second longer, or any parameter like that starts to change, we can use those as indicators for predictive maintenance. Um, you know, a great example is if you've got some heavy equipment at a construction site, and this equipment is being monitored at the engine, at the braking level, all of a sudden, if this particular component starts to take a little bit longer to brake, right? We don't have any telemetry on the brake pads or the discs or the tracks or anything like that. But simply the fact that we've noticed, hey, normally this thing takes 10 seconds to brake and come to a complete stop. Now it's taking 12 seconds. That's a variance of 20%. Um, 
you know, it might not sound like a lot, two seconds, but when you talk about it in terms of 20%, I'm sure none of us here are willing to give up 20% of our paycheck. You know, 20% of anything is a lot. So when we can look at things like that and correlate that to a potential maintenance event, right? Hey, this tractor is taking 20% longer to slow itself down. Is there any benefit for us to check the braking system? And certainly enough, you go and you check out the braking system and we can see that the brake pads are worn, the calipers are worn, which is why this device is taking longer to stop. So that's a great example of us watching a device at the network level, baselining it and profiling it, and then being able to report back when there's a deviation in any of those parameters that we're paying attention to. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about specifically around OT, um, you know, you're, you're talking about braking of a, of, a, of a tractor, right? Well, if those brake pads fall, go out, that could lead to, you know, uh, equipment failure, equipment damage, and more importantly, it could lead to actual, you know, physical damage of a person, right? It could lead to loss of life or injury. Um, so I think where, you know, that predictive maintenance becomes so much more important, I think, with the OT world than it does in IT, right? If something, you know, if, if a laptop's, you know, taking longer to boot up, and eh, people really don't care, right? And it's not gonna, it's not gonna ruin your day, right? But you know, let's say the brake pads wear out because you know the next scheduled maintenance was in six months, and you know the the operator of the tractor has a has a lead foot and it's hitting the brakes quite a bit, um, and it's wearing out more than you would expect. Being able to tell that difference becomes extremely important. I think about, you know, I was thinking about with, um, you know, my I. My wife got a new car last year and, you know, anybody that's been driving a car for more than 10 years remembers, you know, or is very familiar with checking the oil on a dipstick, right? And pulling it out, you wipe it off and you look at it and you're like, you know, you kind of like, eh, is, is it is it good or is it not? And you have to try a few times and then eventually you get a rough idea of, of when you need to replace your oil. Um, versus now my wife's car, it actually just has a little indicator. It says, okay, there's 20% life left in your oil. You should look at changing it soon, right? And I think that's where that the monitoring of OT devices offers promise, right? The ability to do more accurate predictive maintenance instead of relying on a schedule, right? I think, you know, I, I admit I rely far too heavily on the little sticker in my window that says, okay, you need to get yeah. your oil changed at X mileage. Um, versus actually going in and checking it, right? And so I think that's one of the promises that a SOC offers from an OT reliability perspective is the ability to go in and do that, that monitoring to look if something's gonna be failing. You bet, and often the changes that we're tracking are things of a nature that are human imperceptible. You know, and that's a great example, Go just going back to the brakes. Would a human even know if it took 11 seconds to stop versus 10? In general, no, that's something that's human imperceptible. And there's a number of other factors and parameters that have similar tie-ins like that, which is why the technology becomes so important. When we can spot these things at the technology level and offer some insight, that predictive maintenance is often cost saving for the customer. Um, and I mean, the biggest cost of all, like you mentioned, is a human life. You know, and, and I think that, that gives us a good segue, right? Because we're, we're talking about that operational monitoring and watching for predictive maintenance, that indicates a different type of alert or a different type of information being fed into a SOC, right? And so that's where we start looking at back at staffing, right? And the ability to have the right people be able to, to staff the SOC or have the right people that can respond to, to an incident, right? And so traditionally, you know, I would say that a SOC was fairly well self-contained. Right. The, you know, you had input from the security team, maybe from the desktop team or maybe from the server team, but all of those folks were part of the larger IT organization. Right. Um, now, when you start getting alerts on, you know, in a SOC, if you're monitoring, you know, response time or whatever from your OT devices, that requires new skill sets. Right. And that requires reaching outside of your traditional organization to bring more people in to actually make a decision or know what to do. Right. And so that's where. I think you know we start needing to look a little bit further out around who is informing responses in the SOC, right? Who who do we talk to? Um, have you had any experience with you know having teams to try and you know try and coach teams to start reaching outside their 
their their their regular um, touch points to get more information around SOC. Yeah, and again, this kind of ties back to something we've keyed in on several times in this conversation is the education component. Um, this is why cross training is important. This is why it's important to be inclusive of your SOC team within other business units and vice versa. Quite often um, in a number of our customers that are really diving into this and are serious about their OT security, they've started to staff their SOC with dedicated OT personnel. This is people that have previously been on the team, people that are on the team and people that are able to help and cross train other staff members to be able to identify these things. Um, and further to that, the tools that we're using now are also getting a little more intelligent. So the types of alerts that we're sending, we can now tune who starts to get things. So we can make it a little bit easier for the SOC in the sense that we're not going to set send a very complicated OT alert to an IT analyst. We have the ability to do some shaping and customization as to who's going to receive different types of information. So we can help um, eliminate confusion and fatigue that way as well. And, and that so it, it really becomes like if we if I really want to boil it down into, you know, a, a couple factors, I think the SOC really boils down to people in process, right? The, you know, having the right people staffing the, the SOC, but then also building out those business processes, right? Those responses, the, all of these, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, there's an event and now I need to contact, you know, Sandeep to, to see what this event is about. That's a little simplistic, right? A lot of times, you know, a lot of organizations have, you know, their their workbook or their runbook for incidents when a sock, you know, in a sock. So incident X comes in. Let me see what I do with that. Okay, well, I need to do. I need to check this this factor and this factor. And then if those are, you know, those are red, then I need to contact Sandeep, right? And and I think that's part of what gets lost is building out that process, right? And building out the you know, the, the procedures for who to contact and, and who to talk to. Super, super point to bring up, Bruce. And that's why at Nozomi, we've spent so much time developing what we're calling playbooks, right? This is something new for us because we also figured out that the most valuable thing to our customers is obviously getting that alert, but secondary, what to do with it. So we're starting to provide some information for customers that when certain types of alerts occur in your environment, we're giving a little bit of a framework for remediation to start to help that process. And again, as we've discussed, the way to address OT alerts and alarms is very different than the way we would address an IT based alert or alarm. So things like our playbooks are helping customers with um, IR, right? Incident response is what this really boils down to. What do I do when I get this alert? IR is traditionally where customers find themselves struggling. They're great at getting the alert, they're great at acknowledging the alert, but when it comes to actually resolving the incident, this is where things have a little bit of a disconnect. So what we're trying to do is strengthen your average SOC analyst by arming him or her with more information specifically about OT alerts and what the mitigation steps and processes may be. So, Sandeep, I want to talk a little bit about the differences between build versus buy, right? I think a lot of organizations are maybe having to make that decision. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of change over the last, even just the last couple of years, I think with COVID and a lot of, you know, a lot of the issues that, that people are running into as far as, you know, remote work and, and all of these factors. That it starts, I think I'm seeing a lot more organizations having to make that decision. Do I build my own SOC in-house or do I outsource it, right? So what, what are your thoughts on, on build versus buy? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a sensitive area, really, because when you think about it, it's, it's simplistic when it comes off your tongue, build versus buy. But when you start to actually dissect the mechanics behind each of those models, we understand how much more there really is to it. You know, it's more than budget. It's more than just CapEx versus OpEx, right? That's the easy part of the decision. I think what it boils down to is understanding what are your expectations as an organization, right? Nothing will be successful that is outsourced that hasn't had the time and planning put into it. You know, rule number one, never outsource something you don't understand because you're going to get hosed. You know, it's not going to work out well. 
The best success from outsourced projects are the projects that are understood to a bulletproof level by the customer, including every outcome. So when you fully understand something, once you can fully operate it yourself to the master level, that is the time to potentially consider outsourcing because you know what to expect. You've built the process before. Oftentimes when customers turn to outsourcing, there's a huge lead up period simply to define what the expectations are. And it's hard to define your expectations when you don't know what you're getting into. So it's a bit of, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg type scenario. Well, what are you looking for? Well, we don't know. What do you think we should need? Well, we don't know either because we don't know your business. So it's a little bit of a circular tail chasing exercise. Build versus buy, either decision needs the same framework to get to the decision. So that is understanding your environment. What do we want to monitor? What is considered mission critical? What are the responses that we want out of these different types of alerts? Um, you know, and then even things like what does the uh, personnel base look like? Do we have the people in house that can execute on this? Does our outsourcing partner have the right people in house that can execute on these very specific types of threats and alerts we're going to be sending to them? You know, so it's a, it's a much larger initiative, even if you do decide to buy. It's again, it's not as simple as buying something on Amazon. There's months and months of legwork that need to go into it. You need to provide your SOC management organization, whether it's in-house or out of house, but they still need to be provided with the playbooks of what to do. You know, nobody can do that for you because it's going to vary by company, even within the same vertical. Yeah, I think back to an implementation I did of, you know, a, a managed sim. And I think the shortest, r most rushed we did was about a two and a half month transition, right? From managed, you know, on site to actually having us take over, right? And so, um, and, and, that, and that was extremely fast. And I got a lot of flack from our SOC team for trying to push it through so quickly. Uh, but, you know, the customer was in dire straits, right? But it comes back to, and, and you, you were talking about you wouldn't buy unless you knew exactly what you, were, what you had to do yourself. Uh, but it's also, I think the reverse is true as well. You shouldn't be building if you don't have a good idea of what the issues are, right? And what you need oh. to accomplish, right? And so that does come back to the the expertise, right? The the people in process. And and that's one of those things where from a outsourcing perspective, let's say you've got, you know, all of your OT, the, all of the people in your organization with OT knowledge are working on the OT devices themselves 24 seven, and you can't really have them be working in in, in the sim or in the SOC, right? So maybe your your you know from maybe your organization only has OT people that have to be doing the daily job and don't have OT security people that can that can staff the 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 SOC. So that maybe that's an outsourcing issue, right? So that's where you go. Okay, well let me find a partner that is knowledgeable in OT and has those people that can staff the SOC um, to be able to provide that level of of expertise. And and I I would say I would I would even argue now that. That's that's a pretty niche skill set, right? I, I think if I I can count on you know maybe one hand people that I know personally that have that really good ability to go IT OT security back and forth from a from a, a SOC response perspective, right? Um, so it becomes it's it's a very limited uh, level of expertise that people have, um, and that's one of those things where I think it's important to go and, and start looking at outsourcing, right? And say okay, well who you know, is, is this partner that I'm considering, what's their knowledge base or how many customers they have in my particular environment or in my particular industry? Um, and that's where it becomes very important to look at that people and process. But let's, let's go a little bit beyond the security again, right? And let's talk about the operational monitoring, right? And let's talk about, you know, how do we, how can a SOC be used for, for operational monitoring and for maybe like a predictive maintenance perspective? Yeah, very important. And we see our customers turning to that more and more increasingly. Again, because of our ability to baseline and profile a process in particular, we know what good should look like. If we've got a customer manufacturing 
rubber ducks. We know exactly, you know, to the micro command, what it looks like to successfully manufacture a rubber duck in every step of the process. So as we are watching that and learning it, and at a certain point we collaborate with the customer and we say, hey, you know, is this a good representation of what normal looks like? Customer will say, yeah, perfect. We then flip our tool from learning mode into protecting mode. So now if anything within that process line changes, whether it's the temperature of the plastic or the speed of the conveyor belt or the quantity of black paint to paint the duck bill or whatever it happens to be, all of those things can be quantified down to process variables. Everything in that I just talked about can be boiled down to a zero or a one. And we are watching those zeros and ones in real time. So if a component of the process slows down, for instance, if the plastic injection molding equipment is operating too hot and it's spitting out these rubber ducts that are still melting, which are then getting spray painted with something that's on a melting thing, you can see how that impacts the entire process all the way down. Whereas our ability to very early on identify the fact that, hey, this plastic injection molding equipment is running too hot. We've been baselining this thing and it's never run this hot before. It's always operating between 102 and 107 degrees. However, right now we're getting temperature readings off of it that are 119. So we are able to help spot that at the first step of the process instead of waiting till the end when these things come plopping off a conveyor belt to be packaged and we see that they're all deformed. You know, so we've got the ability to understand early on, and this ties into predictive maintenance, instead of burning that whole batch and wasting how much material, who knows? And of course, I'm just making up the example of rubber duck factory. This can be a pipeline supplying gas to a large chunk of a country or a continent, right? The same processes and principles apply in terms of us baselining and profiling the process. So it all starts with learning what is good. And then the second we start to spot abnormalities, from that baseline, that's when our predictive analytics and information awareness kicks off. Further to that, you know, we're talking about SOC, we're talking about SIM, great. However, our platform also has the ability to interoperate with multiple different business units, right? We're not a single threaded tool that's sending every single alert to the SIM and to the SOC. Because let's be honest, there are certain alerts that are of zero value or no value to the SOC and the SIM. So we can take our tool and we can start to tune it and say, hey, if you see these types of alerts, I want you to send these to Bruce. But if you see these type of alerts, I want you to send those to the SOC because these are something that they can handle, right? So we can start to help with prioritization of messaging instead of having to send everything to one single clearinghouse and leave it to the SOC team to sift through it and figure out how to triage it. So we've got a number of enhancements and features within the platform that allow for what I call operational efficiency, right? At the end of the day, we're here to make the rubber ducks. We're not here to spend time working in IT. So at the end of the day, our goal is to help our customers become more operationally efficient and the way we do that is by having things like predictive analysis, um, tunable alert messaging, customized alert tuning, and of course, individual baselining and profiling per customer, per business line. Uh, that's great, great point. Um, you know, and I, and I think when, you know, as people start setting up a, a SOC, and I, I, one of the things that I've, I've noticed um, dealing with, you know, these, these sort of transitions is a lot of times people will start, you know, and they're, they're just going to do it all in house, right? And they go, all right, I've, I'm good. I've got this IT sock that I've been running forever. We've got it all nailed. We've got it really bolted down and it should be the same, like adding in OT. Oh, well that should just be adding like a couple more devices to my overall workload. And it's not quite that way. Right. So, I mean, what, what have you seen from, you know, um, a transition period? Have you seen any issues where, you know, people think that it's going to be an easy, an easy hike and then they realize that suddenly they're, they're a little bit overwhelmed? 
You know, in fact, it's the opposite, Bruce. People are reluctant to go down this road because they can see what a challenging and potentially painful endeavor this can be. Um, so that's why, you know, today in mid 2022, we're having conversations with global Fortune 100 organizations who have never pulled their OT environments into a SOC before. This is something brand new for them. They've been paralyzed, you know, with either information overload or insufficient information. And as a result, the project keeps getting pushed. Again, it's that if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. So it is a challenge um, trying to get customers to change their way of thinking to include OT and be more inclusive of those systems when it comes to overall security posture. Too, for too long, it's been treated like a separate entity, separate business, separate teams, separate tools. You know, it's not uncommon for us to walk into a large customer and find them using two or three competing tools from three different vendors simply because the different business units, A, don't communicate with each other, B, don't trust each other, or C, you know, have no knowledge that there is a centralized process. So I would say it's more often the opposite of customers being pushed there out of circumstance. Either something's happened to them, something happened to appear in their vertical, or they're getting extreme amounts of pressure from their board. Oh, that's good. That's great insight. And I think that, you know, that, that maybe takes a step back to looking at the, the bigger picture around building out a SOC, right? Um, because I think, you know, having a SIM doesn't mean you have a SOC, right? And it's like, you know, it's like putting, you know, putting a flashy spoiler on your car isn't going to suddenly make it go faster, right? And I think that's, that's an issue that a lot of uh, organizations run into. They say, well, I'm just going to throw a SIM in, SIM in here, staff it, and, and we're good to go, right? And I think that's that's a big hurt, you know, hurdle that a lot of organizations have to get over is that a SOC is more than just reading alerts, right? There's a lot of, of, of factors that go into it. Um, and that's where I think we take a, we can take a look at kind of the different cyber maturity levels of IT and OT. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I, you know, from my perspective, I see, you know, I, I kind of see OT security trailing a bit, you know, as far as the overall cybersecurity model goes. Um, what, what are your, what's your insight on that? You know, that's a great point. And, and one of the things I, I tell people all the time is SIM is not a magic bullet. Your SIM is not going to send you a page at three in the morning and say, hey, Bruce Snell from the US tried to access this machine from a Mac and it looks like he's trying to break into it and he may be doing something nasty. We're not sure of his intentions. No tool is going to do that for you. You need, that's where that correlation and context comes in handy, right? I need to be able to take a number of different events, correlate them into an incident, determine whether or not that incident is requiring human intervention and further to that, figuring out which human or which team to send that to. So yeah, a SIM is not a magic bullet. And in fact, we've seen customers that thought that just by buying a SIM that would solve their problems. And while it may allow them to check a box on a compliance spreadsheet for their management, operationally and realistically, they've, they've introduced more confusion, if anything, because now they've got this other box that's overloading people's inboxes with all these alerts. Um, and people can't keep up with it, so they go into it, and the only thing they know how to do, how to manage it, is to start muting things, thereby defeating the entire purpose. So if you're looking for something that will just do silent audit logging, yeah, go look at a syslog server, you know? If you're actually interested, though, in developing out a process and a set of procedures whereby we have mitigations and resolutions to common occurring problems, that's when you need to start thinking about more of a SOC as opposed to just a static syslog server. Oh, that's great. And I have two questions. One, how did you see the alert from to IT about me being dodgy on my computer? That's what I want to know. Um, and two, uh, <laughs> two more importantly, um, let's let's talk about that, right? So, like, I mean, not every event is a level ten, right? And not every event is going to have the same response right and so you know how would you 
you know, from a from a SOC organization perspective, how would you handle the difference between saying a laptop's been hacked versus a safety system is is failing to report? Like, what's what's it look like from a, a process perspective? Yeah, and that's a good question, you know. And and the unfortunate reality is, one man's alert is another man's non-alert, you know. So it's it's very individualized per organization. We have to understand what is normal to one organization, an alert coming off saying, hey, this Modbus device has received a function code seven, to one organization that may be normal, whereas to another organization that could be an infiltration attempt. So we really need to understand a customer's environment. That's where it starts with. There is no one size fits all. And as we get more and more into OT, that becomes more and more true. So it's really knowledge, understanding, communicating with the teams, being able to positively understand what good behavior looks like, because then it's very easy to spot what bad behavior looks like. Um, we keep coming back to this central theme and it really is education. Now that's perfect, Sandy. You've been, you know, and I, and I think that you really summed it up, right? I think it is ultimately comes down to education and knowing your environment. And I think those are the two most important issues because it, to, to your point, out of the box, you know, I can't tell if event A is the same severity for me as it is for you, right? And I think that's that's something that people really run into. Um, you know, Sandeep, I know you're extremely busy, so I, I appreciate you being able to take the time with us today to, to answer some questions and, and have a conversation about, about SOX. Um, any, you know, any kind of closing thoughts from you on, you know, the, the, the IT versus OT and, and how they fit into a SOC? Yeah, no. And, and first off, I want to thank you again for having me on the program today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, catching up, um, like always. You know, final thoughts are, it, again, it really ties back to that education. Know your environment. Understanding the capabilities of your team is very important. Um, some organizations end up supporting IT uh, or OT equipment, sorry, through acquisition where all of a sudden you've got a company that buys another company and inherits a technology or a process that they had no exposure to before. You know, that's a great example of what do we do? Where do we start? You know, a common uh, thought may be to, hey, let's just outsource this, but without fully understanding it yourself, how can you explain to your outsourcing company what your expectations are? You know, um, IT and OT convergence is happening. SOC convergence is happening, whether it's an on-prem customer managed SOC or a third party managed SOC, I think it's very important to be able to communicate what your expectations are, what your needs are. And also you need to continue to work closely with your SOC team because although the environment may not change, technology changes, technology in the SOC changes, process can change. And it's, uh, it's like doing open heart surgery on someone who's jogging. A lot of these systems cannot tolerate downtime. You can't just reboot a system in OT like you would in IT. So it becomes very, very important to understand the business, understand the business needs, understand the impact of these critical systems and building out playbooks about specifically what to do at this organization for an alert of this type. So Sandeep, thank you for joining us today. And I also want to thank the viewers for tuning in. Um, you know, please make sure to subscribe to our channel so that you can be alerted when there's new videos that are out. Uh, we have a lot more exciting content coming out. And so I hope to see you soon. Thank you for tuning in.